Well, praise the Lord. It's, you know, it's, it's so encouraging when you walk in and somebody who's supposed to be your friend walks up to you and says, you know, if I'd have known you were preaching, I'd have stayed home today. <laughs> Thanks, Dougie. Doug and, and Claudia are going down the uh, Colorado River this week in a float trip, and I'm praying for him, believe you me. <laughs> I'm praying I won't see him again. <laughs> Lord, touch him. Claudia's put out a lot of money on a life insurance policy, and her and I are, her and I are going to collect when she pushes him out. But, Doug, I love you, you know, I, you know, with friends like you, who needs enemies? This is so good. Chad and Tosh are in uh, Washington, D.C. Mariah flew back home. We picked her up Friday, Thursday, Friday. And uh, they had gone, the day before, they had gone to the Museum of the Bible there in Washington, D.C., and she said how great that was. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but how many of you are 50 years of age, at least one, the spouse or the the husband or the wife, one of you is 50 years of age and above. Tonight, I know you are, Doug. <laughs> Tonight we have our 50 plus, and we have an incredible time. Uh, we would love to have you join us. It starts at 6 o'clock back in the uh, volunteer room, and your presence would be so uh, uh, such a blessing. And here's the good news. If you're a first-time guest, you get to go first in the food line, and you don't have to bring any food at that. So, you see, you can't beat that. So we'd love to have you join us tonight for our 50-plus. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. I think someone used this and read from here just a, three or four weeks ago, but this is the scripture that God laid upon my heart. The thought that I'm going to be delivering to you today is the garment of praise. Jay talked last week about worship. I'm going to talk to you today about praise. We get the two confused oftentimes, and we talk about them as if they're the same thing. And they're, they're close, and they have the same ramifications, but they're not exactly the same. Isaiah 6, verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Chad has, your pastor has, has, has talked a lot, I think some of it from his own situation of about Depression, discouragement, weariness. These are things that are impacting the church world today. These lead to anxiety, panic attacks, sickness, distress, worry, fear, frustration, hurt. I mean, at least all kinds of battles that we in the church are facing today. I, I really believe that the devil has attacked the church with a spirit of heaviness, as it mentions in Isaiah 61, verse 3. Even in many of our churches today, people will come in with a heavy heart, discouraged, down, and depressed, and they will leave the same way. They will leave discouraged, down, depressed, and beaten, and defeated. And that's not the way it's supposed to be, but that's what's going on. Even, even the world itself is under a, 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 an, an attack the world, if you want to say it this way, the world is heavy. The Democrats can't work with the Republicans, and the Republicans can't work with the Democrats. If the Republicans say it's a cold day outside, the Democrats say it's hot. If the uh, Democrats say it's a wonderful day, the Republicans say it's, uh, it's a bad day. So we can't get along. We can't, we can't work together. And, I mean, there's so much trouble going on. Turn on the news if you don't believe me. Watch the news. 
If you want to get discouraged, watch the news. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's nothing but bad. It's, it, somebody just got shot. Somebody just got killed. Somebody, well, some group's protesting against another group, and everybody's having a bad day. If the stock market goes up, we can't even enjoy it because, well, we know it's going to go back down. So negativism is the rule of the day. Heaviness reigns. But let me tell you something. If heaviness and, and negativism floats your ship today, your ship is about to sink. Because we are going to kick heaviness and depression and discouragement out of this building today. And we are going to declare to you what Isaiah 61, 1 through 4 tells us. That he has sent us to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent us to heal the brokenhearted. He has sent us to proclaim liberty to the captives. To open your prison doors, whatever your prison doors may be, they can fly open today. He has sent us to comfort all who mourn. And folks, this is the purpose of the church. We are not, we're not here to discourage you and put you down and, and, and make you depressed. The church is here to lift you up. We're to proclaim beauty for ashes to give you the oil of joy for mourning and to give you a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. That's the title of my sermon this morning, the garment of praise. In other words, you ain't going to leave here today depressed. We don't want you to leave here today discouraged and down and heartbroken and heavy hearted. We want you to leave Destiny Church on Sunday, July the 14th. I had to stop and think what it was. Sunday, July the 14th, 2019, we want you to leave here with a joy bubbling up inside of you and people look at you and wonder, what in the world have they got going on? Instead of going around down and discouraged all the time, I'm not saying that you'll never have any problems again, but if you will develop a spirit of praise instead of a spirit of negativism, you will find your life much, much better. You're still going to have problems, still going to have battles, <coughs> still going to have those days when it seems like everything is going wrong. But if you'll just wake up and the first thing out of your mouth is, Lord, I love you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. I have never liked the idea of Blue Monday. You ever heard that term? It's Blue Monday because you got to go back to work. I, th I, I choose to look at it differently, and I choose to say it's a great day because I've got a job. You know what I'm saying? Instead of it, every day should be a good day because it's, it's what God has put us in. So there are some important things that I have learned in my 39 years on this earth. Well, okay, I'm going to be honest with you, 39 plus a couple more years. That I have learned some things and I want to share them with you this morning. Point number one is this. Grumbling, complaining, Griping and negativism gets you nowhere. Now, even as I said that, I realized that's wrong. Grumbling, griping, negativism, and complaining will get you somewhere. But it's all bad. It's going to take you into depression. It's going to take you into sorrow. It's going to take you into pain. It's going to, it's going to put you down in the dumps. You can choose to grumble your way through life if you choose to do so, okay? You can say, well, hey, I've just made my mind that I am a very good grumbler, so I am going to, uh, I'm going to make that the theme of my life, to grumble and complain. And there are people, let me, let me, let me ask you this question. Is there, do you know of anybody that you don't dare ask them how they're doing? You know what I mean? There have been people that I have said to myself, I will never ask them again. And then it's just such a habit that I walk up to them and I say, how are you doing? And it's a 20 minutes lecture on all the bad that's happened in their lives. I try never to ask people like that how they're doing. It's not that I don't care. It's just that I don't want to hear it. So you know what I'm talking about. I know whereof I speak, because I, I got an A-plus in this grumbling class at one time. Normally in my life, I'm very upbeat. I enjoy life. I have a great time. I, I like to have fun. I like to joke. I like to cut up. 
And for years, people would ask me, how are you doing? And I would answer, oh, I'm doing so great. If the Lord, I mean, I can't take much more. Uh, the Lord's so good to me that I can hardly stand anymore. So, but I went through a stretch. Jason and Michelle will know what this is about. But I went through a stretch in my life of about eight years when it seemed like everything had turned against us. Uh, I, I, I don't ever want to go through an experience like that again. If, if the Lord comes to me today and says, son, you grew during that time. Do you want to volunteer for that again? I'd say, no, Lord, I'm not volunteering. I don't want to go through that again. But I'm telling you, I, I, I got so good at this grumbling and griping thing. As a pastor, I, I would always take about an hour to pray. And so during this time, I would pray for my hour, and I'd finish my prayer time. I'd get up, and I wouldn't feel a bit better, wouldn't feel any victory in my life. This went on for close to a year. Finally, I, I was complaining to God one day. Can you imagine that? Complaining to God, and I said, God, my, my prayer time just isn't being productive. I'm not, I'm not getting anything done. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you're not praying. Oh, yeah, I, I just spent an hour in prayer. No, you're not praying. All you're doing is grumbling and griping and complaining during your hour of what you call prayer. And I realized as I thought about it, that's exactly right. For the last year, all I had done was grumble and complain, and I couldn't understand why I wasn't seeing victory, duh. You know, that's the way we are in life. We, we, we complain so much. We, we get in such a habit of it. How are things going for you? Oh, I tell you what, it's just not very good. And, and, and I joke with many of you, you'll ask me how I'm doing, and I'll act like things are going bad. But I want you to know, I'm serious when I say God is so good to me that I can hardly stand it at times. doesn't mean I don't have bad days. It doesn't mean that I don't have problems. But it means that my God treats me as good as anybody he has ever known. He is so good to me, and he wants to be the same with you. But you've got to praise him. You can't grumble your way through to victory. The children of Israel were a perfect example of what I'm talking about. I mean, they were so good at grumbling and griping. God would do miracle after miracle after miracle for them. And I mean, things were just, they, they were, they were, Get, get, they'd gotten out of, of Egypt, and they were free now. They weren't slaves. They'd been slaves for 430 years, and now they were, they were free. They should have been shouting and praising and dancing and all of this, but they, they, they were so blessed. I mean, they walked through the desert for 40 years, and their shoes and their clothes never wore out. Now, to my wife, that would not be good. That would, whew, that would be the worst thing that could happen to her. She would gripe about that. God, it's not fair. I don't get to go to the mall and buy me a new dress. I don't get to go to the mall and buy me a new pair of shoes. How many of you men can relate to this? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, uh, my wife would have been so unhappy to get up every day, put on the same shoes and the same dress. Oh, this is so awful. As a matter of fact, how many of you guys have, I, when we were pastoring at Nixa, there were several Sundays that Marquita would walk in. She would uh, uh, look so pretty in, in, a, in a new outfit that she had bought, and she would walk in, and, but after a few minutes, she'd come up to me and say, I'm going home. I'd say, why? What's wrong? i got to change clothes. Why? I thought, well, maybe she'd spilled something. No, Sister so-and-so has the same dress on. They have the same blouse on. They got the same pair of shoes on. And she would go home and change because somebody else had the same clothes on. We guys, if you walk in with the same shirt that I've got on, I walk up to you. You are my buddy from that time forward. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, we walk up, we'll put our arms around each other and say, man, you got such good taste, but not a woman. Uh-uh, uh-uh, that is bad. If a woman comes in... Someone has the same clothes on that. They got to go home and change. Or either that or hide. Uh, you know, don't let anybody see them because they don't want them to know that they shop at the same place that anybody else does. So back to the children of Israel. I mean, they just got out of bondage, but all they were, they were griping. And, and the first problem that came up in Exodus 16, 2 and 3, then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. 
And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the pots of meat and we, we ate bread to the full, it was such a wonderful time being in slavery. For you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Makes you sick, doesn't it? They were the ones that got it started when they were complaining about how cruel they were being treated. But now that they were free, they were complaining that they were free. They wanted to go back into slavery. You know, I used to think that the children of Israel <clears throat> were the grumbling us, griping us, complaining us people. I know those aren't words. But I thought I always thought they probably had had it down to a science until I looked in the mirror one day. And Mike, when I looked in the mirror, I realized I'm probably just as bad. You know, I grumble, I gripe. I mean, if I don't get everything that I want, why, I was just like them for months and months. <coughs> to where I, I would grumble, I would gripe. People would ask me how I'm doing. I'd say, well, I'm, I'm holding in there. I'm surviving. But you know, God never meant for Christians to just survive. God meant for Christians to thrive, not survive. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to enjoy your Christianity. He wants you to enjoy life. So if all you can do is grumble and gripe and complain, I've got some advice for you. Hush. Shut your mouth. Put a zip on it because you're not going to get anywhere. I mean, it's just, it's, it's like the story I heard with a little boy. Went to visit his grandparents one day, and Grandpa on the farm, and Grandpa was taking him around to seeing the cows and the horses and brought him to some, some of his prized mules. And he was telling his grandson, son, now these mules are very valuable, and, and their pedigree and all of this. And the little boy wasn't impressed by that. But he looked at one of the mules, and he said, Grandpa, that mule must have Grandma's religion. Grandpa looked down and said, Son, what are you talking about? What do you mean that that mule has grandma's religion? Well, that mule has a sad, long face just like grandma does. So how many of us are like that? How many of us go around and all the world sees of us, we're Christians, and, and we want the world to know that we're Christians, and all they see out of us is unhappiness, sadness, and we never have a good day. Now, how many of you want to live a life like that? Now, you say nobody wants to live a life like that. I dare, to, I dare to disagree with you. I have dealt with them. Over the years, there were people, I have dealt with people who wanted to be down and discouraged all the time because they got sympathy, they got pity, and that's what they lived on. As a matter of fact, I remember a time, Marquita, you'll probably recall this. We were having a great move of God at Nixon, and uh, there was a family there that she was, she had perfected that. She wanted to be down. She wanted to be discouraged so that everybody could feel sorry for her. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, go tell her that she's got to want victory. Right now, Doug, you don't have to, to leave. I, I, I'm not, Doug, I'm not, Doug, I'm not, Doug, I'm not through yet. Doug, he's going to leave anyway, so I hope that boat goes down. I went up to her and I said, you know, God, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and told me to tell you that you are living in self-pity. You're living in discouragement. You, you want to be discouraged more than want victory. And I told her what God had spoken to me, and I knew I'd heard from heaven. She got mad and left the church. So, But about two years later, I saw her husband, and he came up to me and said, you know that night that you were talking to my wife and you told her all of those things? I said, yeah, I remember well. He said, everything that you told her was exactly the truth. And I said, I know that. I knew it was. And, and most of the time, people like that are going to get mad if you tell them that because they don't want to hear it. They want everybody to feel sorry for them. But I'm telling you, I believe what God wants is for the joy of the Lord. Point number two is this. <coughs> he wants the church to experience the joy of the Lord. Nehemiah 8.10. We've heard it so many times. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord. But so often the church goes around 
we're, we're so bogged down and so troubled and so discouraged and so depressed that the world looks at us and says, if that's Christianity, I want nothing to do with it whatsoever. But I believe we need to have the joy of the Lord. That's why in this sermon this morning, I'm being a little bit lighthearted because I felt like that the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I want the people to know that Christianity can be fun. Serving me can be a joy. It can be a delight. It can be the time of their life instead of enduring to the end. Listen closely. You will never, ever experience victory in your life as until you quit living in a negative. Nice to have you back, Doug. Thank you for coming back. You got victory. I had stepped on his toes, and he had to go out and pray about it. But you'll never, you'll never experience victory until you quit complaining all the time and being a negative spirit. Negative. One of the things that has amazed me over the years, when I was pastor at Nixon, we would have a family in the church that they were very, very negative. And I'm not referring to any particular family, but let's say that we, you could tell that they were very negative. A new family would come in, and they'd sit on the opposite side of the church, and after a few weeks, you would realize that they also had a negative spirit about them. And some way, somehow, they say opposites attract, uh-uh, ain't true in the spiritual world. Negative people will find negative people, and they will start running together, and their negativism just increases. Ask yourself, what are the people like that you run with? It will tell you what kind of person you are. If you're a negative-spirited person, you're going to do it. Now, the opposite of that is true. Positive-minded people will find positive-minded people. Get around people that want to have a good time. Get around people that the joy of the Lord is just bubbling up inside of them, and they're so happy that it's almost illegal. They just walk around with a smile on, your, on their face, and they're so happy with life. Quit hanging around people that are negative all the time. Find people that will fill you with joy. And, 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 and jo I'm not talking about foolishness. Like, you know, I can sometimes get overboard and, and, and become foolish, and I know that. But have fun. Laugh. Be glad. Be joyful. When people see you, make them want to know you're God. Because you're having such a good time. Well, you're having problems and you still act like things are going well. It's because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Psalms 18.24 says, This is the day that the Lord has made. What? I will rejoice and be glad in it. Some of you need to type that up or print it up. Put it on your mirror. Put it on your refrigerator because the refrigerator is probably the place that you see the most. Put it on your refrigerator door so that you can see that every day. I'm serious. Wake up. The first thing you, th thing you can say is, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. I'm ready to meet Jesus. And so heaven is my home. You ever known people that talk about, well, they can't wait to get to heaven so they, you know, they can enjoy their Christianity? I've heard enough of this, and, and, and people talk about it and, and indicating that they would not enjoy their Christianity until they got into eternity. Many years ago, I made up my mind I wasn't going to live that kind of life. I'm going to enjoy my life here on earth. I'm going to have a good time being a Christian here knowing yeah, there are going to be hard times that confront me. There are times during that eight, nine-year period that just brought me to my knees, and I would just weep, and, and I, was, I was so heartbroken with everything that was going on. But this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Going back to a scripture, 40, uh, Psalms 47.1 says, Come, everyone. And clap for joy. Why do people clap at church? Aren't we supposed to be respectful and silent and, and long-faced and, and show no emotion at church? Have you, have, let me ask you a question. Have you ever gone to a church that you were bored out of your mind? Now, be honest. 
don't be so spiritual. No, I've never been to one of those. Lying right through your teeth. You've gone and you couldn't wait till the service was over because it was so boring and so dead and nobody acted like they had a good time and nobody acted like they had any life in them. That's not the way I want to go. I, 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 want, I want to be a part of a church that is full of joy and has a good time. Yes, we get serious. Yes, we know that we have some very heavy times in this church, but I want you to know that you can be joyful. You can walk around to where the people will see you and they'll look. They say, I wish I had what he had. I wish I had what she had. I wish I could have that kind of joy. I'm t- it's so vitally, vitally important, and that brings me to my last point. Praise brings the victory. If you want to walk in victory, you've got to learn to praise the Lord. In a book by Christer uh, Bush in, entitled Enter the World of Praise, he states, when you praise God from your heart, you exit the world of worry, heaviness, pride, and stubbornness, and you enter the world of spirit and truth. He also says praise is spiritual dynamite. Praise is dynamite in our mouths. There is no earthly or heavenly weapon that can shut it down. Did you hear that? There is nothing that can stop your praise if you will just dare to believe God. Your praise can bring such joy into your life. If we dare to use praise, we will have reached for a weapon from our heavenly arsenal that when triggered will be heard in God's throne room. That's what praise is. It's dynamite in your mouth. That's powerful to think about. That when I lift my hands and I praise God, then then there is dynamite flowing from me. Psalms 150 verse 6 says, let Everything that has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Now, let me ask this question real quickly. How many of you are still breathing? Let me see your hand. If you're still breathing, raise your hand. Then you've got an obligation to praise the Lord. <laughs> well, I never thought about it that way, preacher, but it's it, it, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Everything. That means you. If you're breathing, you have every right to praise the Lord. But things are going wrong in my life. Praise the Lord because, let me tell you, grumbling won't get the answer. It won't bring any resolution to your life. Understand something very important. Praise doesn't change God. Well, if praise doesn't change God, then what's the value in it for me? I mean, I don't know what I need to do. I can tell you that praise doesn't change God because God doesn't need to be changed. He wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. He wants to love you more than you want to be loved. You understand that? He wants to just dump blessing after blessing after blessing upon you and smile while you're enjoying your life. That's who the that's the God that we serve. How, how do I know that? Well, Matthew 7, 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? No. Praise does not change God. Praise changes you. It's sort of like you're out on the desert, you're dying of thirst, you've got an empty canteen, you know what you're going to do. Somebody comes by that they have buckets of water and and they're willing to share with you, so they start pouring water to, to your canteen, but you notice it's all going right out on the sand. Why? Because you never took the lid off. But when you take that lid off, I mean, you're, 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 you're full of life-filling water. And that's the way praise is. Praise takes the lid off of your life so that God can pour into you. When you begin to praise God, I mean, things happen. So what are we getting ready to do as I, as I, as I come to a close? We're getting ready to praise God. We're getting ready to, to worship God. Jason, you can come back. We're getting ready to take the lid off of our lives so that God can begin blessing us. You understand what I'm saying? Grumbling, complaining, negativism only digs your hole deeper. But when you begin to praise God, all of a sudden, the heavens open wide and you begin to praise. Well, preacher, I don't feel like praising. I have so many problems that I just can't praise without feeling like I'm faking. Then here's what I want you to do. Fake it till you make it. 
I don't feel like, fake it, fake it. You say, well, that's not spiritual. Folks, there's something up pr about praise. When you keep it up, it suddenly becomes real. It becomes something in your life that you enjoy doing. I know I go to bed every night, and I praise God. I wake up every and it's I'm not boasting on myself. It's just become a part of who I am. I mean, I, I, just, I just love him so much and praise him so much. So here's what I want you to do. Every one of you that has a heavy load, you've got marriage problems, you've got financial problems, you've got spiritual problems, you've got uh, family problems of one sort, you've got job problems, you're discouraged, you're depressed, you're down, you're defeated, you're, you're hurting, you, you've got physical problems. Anybody that has any kind of problem whatsoever, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you here in just a moment to stand to your feet, and we're going to come to the front. But when you come to the front this morning, I'm not going to ask anybody to come and lay their hands over you and weep over you and pray despondency to lift. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have you come to the front, and then I'll have others join you. But I want you to come, and you can either raise your hands and praise the Lord, or you can just praise Him silently. You can dance. You can jump. You can shout. You can just say, I love you, Jesus. Say, preacher, I, I just can't see how this is going to work. I mean, you just don't know how bad my problems are. Well, I, can, I have the answer. I mean that. I have the answer. No, not because I'm so smart, but because praise brings the victory. Jay mentioned it last week about Paul and Silas. They praised and the jail cell opened. I mean, it's just a miracle. Jehoshaphat set out to pray. I thought the same thing, Jay. That's the stupidest military strategy I've ever seen. Instead of sending out your big weapons first, he sent out the praisers. But then I got to thinking about it, I thought, he did send out the big weapons first. He sent out the praisers. And that's what I'm going to have you do. So everybody stand right now.